Financial Planner, Flow on YouTube. I think it, well, I think, you know, it, it all was kicked off with this North Korea Trump feud. So I guess you could you could argue that it was a flight to safety, you know, geopolitical scare. And the, the question is, you know, will will it will it fade and go back to where it came from? You know, the 1250 area when this whole thing blows over. And I, you know, I don't know. I, I do know that you know, looking at the open interest, the increase in the open interest the last couple of days, that the New York bullion banks were doing what they could to to put as much COMEX paper into the into the market to to keep gold from I think I think if the COMEX banks were re restricted to keeping the amount of paper they issued based on the amount of gold that's sitting in, in the vaults and I don't even care if it's total gold in the vaults as opposed to registered versus eligible if they had to just issue they could keep their issuance of comex paper say at 120 percent of the amount of gold that's in the vaults i think in the context of what happened this week i think you'd probably see gold closer to 1350 rather than pushing up against 1300 maybe even higher so there was there was a very aggressive concerted effort to keep gold from rising um, you know, at some point, I think they're going to run into a roadblock from the Eastern Hemisphere because India, much to everyone's surprise, I think, India is, I mean, they, they're, the amount of gold that they've been importing on a monthly basis never slowed down, even when they implemented that 3% general sales tax, which included a sales tax on gold items um, or on jewelry or whatever. Um, the, the importation never slowed down, and now we're going into their their largest buying seasonal period. And same with with China, um, and China's China's appetite has picked up this week. Um, and then Turkey is all of a sudden they've shown up on the on the world scene as a massive gold importer, which they also produce gold. The country produces gold, unlike India, so that that makes their importation even more significant, but they're on track to import by far a record amount of gold into their country. Um, so, you know, at some point, I think at least the physical demand has put a floor on on the extent to which the New York bullion banks can, can use paper derivatives to keep the price contained or push it lower. Now, turning to Eric, you know, with Trump saying that he'd bring fire and fury to North Korea if North Korea makes more threats. What is your perspective on how that impacted the precious metal markets? It seems like Dave here is saying that the gold cartel is having a hard time keeping prices down. Well, yeah, I agree entirely with what Dave just laid out. And we, for over a decade, have seen this general pattern where uh, any kind of uh, perturbation to the market you know, sets gold up. You know, we have Brexit as a great example. Gold rised quite a bit and then fell back down after the powers that be were able to issue a lot more contracts and flood the paper markets and push the paper price down. It's like the tail wagging a dog. Um, we, you know, the, the whole catalyst that is represented by the geopolitical um, turmoil is you know, coming in a market that's already tight. That's the principal point that a lot of people who follow the paper markets don't give enough credence to. The physical markets are tight. We have uh, India and China alone consuming more gold on an annual basis than actually is produced every year. We've had drainage out of the ETFs. We've had uh, an, an vault supply declining uh, back in 2013. That started in earnest, and, and that has never corrected itself. We have a silver deficit on the horizon, um, you know, the physical markets are very, very tight. And when anything comes that uh, it disturbs the market enough to elicit a very small amount increase in safe haven buying, we see these price spikes that come in a period of time too fast for the cartel to deal with. And even though they're dumping a lot of new contracts on the COMEX that we can see in the open interest rocketing higher with gold, 
it's not enough to stop gold rising. So that's what we're seeing this week. Um, and all things considered, this isn't actually a really large increase in demand, but it's just happening in a very short period of time. So uh, the markets have been consolidating since the uh, latter part of February in this artificial, horizontal, contrived trading range. You can see it in the gold stocks and in the precious metals themselves. All the while, uh, you know, the dollar was over 101 on the DXY index back in mid-February, and it's been falling ahead, you know, below 93 last week, and now it's beginning to fall again after a big pop um, just because it was oversold. And this, these are conditions where you would expect gold to perform very well, but it hasn't. It's basically just been in this big 1,200 to you know, sub-1,300 trading range, batting around like a ping-pong ball, precisely because this, the new metal is being controlled by the cartel. Uh, at some point this year, I think we're going to break over that, and if it's the North Korean crisis catalyst that helps us get over 1,300 next week, so be it. Uh, it's either going to be that or it's going to be the standard equities markets rolling over and people looking for yet another reason to have at the margin a bit more of a safe haven trade. Uh, you know, people like Ray Dalio, hedge fund manager of the largest hedge fund group in the world, is saying everyone should own 10% gold. You know, people in the, even in the mainstream see those kind of comments and incrementally they increase their exposure. And that's what will ultimately force the cartel to let prices move back higher um, and kind of a managed retreat, as Bill Murphy from GATA likes to describe it as. I think that's what we're going to see later this year in the very least, along with, uh, you know, challenging of 1350 and the standard equity market rolling over. We've had this big move in VIX and the volatility in the market come as well that we're going to talk about later. All these things are inter interlinked, and the valuations of the stock market are really high. Uh, and the economy is not as strong as, as certainly the Fed believes it is. Dave, do you see a breakout coming in the precious metal markets? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, I was kind of, I wrote a, a few things about that in my bi weekly mining stock journal, which, uh, Eric, you should have a copy of it in your, in your inbox somewhere. Um, but um, again, I, I think it's, I think it's a function of of how much gold that the Western bullion banks have available to them to deliver into the Eastern Hemisphere appetite right now. To give you an example, with India, um, usually when you see gold go up as much as it did this week in price, the demand in India slows down and it, it stops for a while because they they're price sensitive. They 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 get like an initial shock. When the price goes up, and they stop buying for a day or two, and then they go back to buying. But this week, the premiums, the import duty X premiums that were being paid over in India until last night were were very positive, which means that there was a lot of gold importation going on, even when gold made its its biggest jump. I think the, its biggest jump, price jump, was either yesterday or Wednesday. So. Um, I, I think eventually the physical market's going to throw a wrecking ball into their ability to push down the, the market using paper derivatives. And, I, you know, it's just impossible to know when we reach that point. I think if, if something happens and gold can shoot over 1300 and, and we can hold that level, because the last I think this is the third time we've been challenging 1300 since gold bottomed. In in twenty in December twenty fifteen, and it, it hasn't been able to hold thirteen hundred. So if, if something can force it over thirteen hundred and it can stay there, and I, I've been told and I've read and I, I don't know how to verify this for myself, but and I don't know anyone who can verify this. But apparently thirteen twenty five is a big flip point where it triggers stop loss cover covers and it also triggers hedge fund momentum buying. So whatever. Whatever the significance is of that number, you know, if that if we can get over that number and the stop loss covering triggers, you know, we could see gold quickly go up to fourteen hundred, and obviously silver will go up along with it. Now, I'd like to move our focus to the VIX, the volatility index. With Trump's North Korea comments, the VIX is now at nearly a ten-month high. 
Dave, what is your perspective? Well, I mean, it's it's a reflection of of the amount of perceived risk and and the amount that the you know the stock market moves up or well really moves down when it when it sells off all of a sudden you have a lot of people buying puts for for insurance protection and that's what drives the VIX higher I mean that's a simplistic explanation but um, you know it, it temporarily reflects some fear that came into the stock market over the the North Korea thing um, but you know this this market is a is is the biggest dry powder keg of explosive material that we've ever had in the history of this country. And all it's going to take, if they let a spark hit that powder keg, this, this whole thing's going to blow up and the stock market's going to have a crash like people have only like dreamed about could possibly happen in their worst nightmares. So, um, I mean, obviously the VIX is one of the, and one of the tools the Fed manipulates to try and induce hedge funds to come in and buy stocks when stocks are selling off. So, um, you know, I, I would have thought that if, if we're supposedly on the verge of nuclear war with, with North Korea, I would have thought that the stock market would have reacted a lot more to the downside. And it just speaks to the degree to which the Fed has removed any fear whatsoever of anything causing the downside scenario to affect the stock market. And I remember I said, I don't know, sometime in the mid 2000s, I just said, you know, I can't believe that this stock market doesn't go lower. I mean, it's so far above its intrinsic value, it's absurd. And at the time I made the comment, you know, a, a small nuclear bomb could hit Times Square in New York City and the Dow would rally 200 points. Well, I think we're, we've reached that point at which the Fed is, is so involved in preventing the stock market from falling and that, you know, it's this thing where really bad news causes the stock market to go higher. So um, in terms of the, the VIX, I don't know, maybe at some point they'll lose control of their ability to push it lower. Who knows? Eric, what is your take? Well, the VIX is... is basically one of the main tools that central bankers and the New York trading desk of the New York Fed have been targeting. Uh, we can't prove that because there's no audit, there's no transparency in what the Fed actually trades, and they're very circumspect with what they do and all of that. But when we, we do know that, for example, the central banks have been dumping over $150 billion of liquidity every month in the markets worldwide, and that's been what's been sustaining our markets where they are, where we have abnormally low interest rates and the whole bond bubble paradigm writ large spilling over to the stock market and you know corporate buybacks being as high as they have been in the last five years and on and on and on. This market is an artificial construct. And if you look at the VIX, if you look at like a five-year chart, and I recommend people listening to our show to go out on the web and find a five-year chart, take a look at it, you won't believe your eyes. In 2013 through most of 2015, it was in a tight range that basically was indicative of, of volatility being non-existent. And then, you know, we finally hit 2017 or halfway through 2016, and VIX begins to decline even further, even before the election of Trump, all the way through to today. You know, with the exception of every once in a while, we get these pops like this week, but they always fade back down. And, and the VIX has been trading down. It went, as, as, you know, went below 10, an all-time low on the VIX this year. And this is an, um, an astounding amount of complacency in our markets when valuations are in many respects at all-time highs. Corporate profits are not strong. The dollar is falling, and that's going to you know, impact profits and and you know everywhere you look the market has all of these artificial supports when all of these supports go away when in some of these supports go away and we have shocks in the market like on a geopolitical risk basis this week people are a little fearful and previously we saw what happened when Trump was talking about backing off on any kind of reform for Obamacare or the prospects of his economic program are going up in smoke, and every once in a while the markets would throw a tantrum, and then the markets would be calmed down by the powers that be that are dumping in over $150 billion worth of liquidity every month. At some point, to answer your question, on a going forward basis, we will see 
the, the markets decline pretty significantly, and that's when the VIX will have pops higher and much bigger than what we saw in this week's time. Uh, we've been over 30 a couple of times in the last two years, and, and we'll, we'll easily slice over 30 when uh, we see the standard equity market decline. Dave, do you see a crash coming in the stock market? Oh, actually, yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's just, there's. Everyone is on the same side of the boat. I, you know, I hate to use cliches like that, but it's a, it's a good way to describe it. Everyone and their mother is long. There's almost no short sellers out there anymore. Like I said, the Fed has made it clear. In so many words, as Eric said, we don't, you can't prove it. And since CNN isn't reporting it and the New York Times isn't reporting it, a lot of people won't believe that the Fed is intervening in this market, but they do. I mean, all you have to do, as Eric pointed out, is look at the $150 billion in liquidity every month that goes in there. And there's more that goes on in terms of swap lines and, and credit extension that we don't get to see, you know, off balance sheet stuff that the Fed does. So, um, you know, at some point, whatever pierces this, this, you know, don't worry about downside risk paradigm that's going on right now, and something will pierce it, you're going to just see an avalanche of selling that they won't be able to contain. It'll be hedge fund algos, it'll be everyone, e ETFs, it's going to be, and I really think they'll unplug the markets. Yeah, very well. And, or certainly dump a ton of liquidity in the face of that tidal wave of selling. We could easily see not necessarily a generic crash in the way most people think of crashes, but kind of like this punctuated you know, dance over like six months where you see 10% down in one month and then the Federal Reserve and ECB and Bank of Japan and all the others going and, and taking evasive action and maybe even, as Dave suggests, unplugging the markets, you know, <laughs> even, maybe even a bank holiday to too. For, they, 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 and they, they've done it before, and, they, and yes. now they're even more aggressive than, 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 their, than their history. Yes. What would unplugging the markets look like? What does that mean? Turn them off. They, they have circuit breakers that come in automatically uh, based on, you know, 15% moves on the downside. And on futures markets, they can shut off futures for the S&P 500. And they can also qualitatively come in and literally just declare that the markets will be suspended for an hour, for a day, what have you. They have the power to do that. They did that back in 2008-9, and they can do it again. And, and they're, they're more equipped to do that kind of evasive actions because they've been studying how to deal with the monstrosity that they've created. They're, they're more interventionist now than they ever have been. They actually remember the. I, I for, it was probably about I don't know three years ago. The New York Stock Exchange just it stopped. It stopped. It just you know it was like someone had pulled the plug on it. Do you remember yeah. that, Eric? Yeah. They, yeah. They, what was it? They they blamed it on a computer power outage. Something like that. The... And, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to find it because I don't remember how long ago it was. But I yeah. had written a blog post and I had found a. A photo of 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 a um, a plug, you know, a lamp plug or whatever, being unplugged from a from a light socket, and I, I cut that out and I put underneath it NYSE circuit breaker. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> here, here it is, right here, NYSE trading circuit breaker. It was um, it was in mid August 2015. I'd like to move our focus to Bitcoin. Bitcoin recently hit another new high, topping. $3,500. David, what is your perspective? I know you recently did a podcast. You were saying that Bitcoin is sucking up all the demand that would be going into gold and silver. Well, I, I wouldn't say all the demand, but I mean, first of all, let's let's just say that, you know, I, I really have concluded that Bitcoin is and all cryptos are in a massive bubble right now. And it, and it, it really reminds me of the tail end of of the internet bubble back in 1999 and early 2000, and and people who are ardent Bitcoin enthusiasts, I mean, it's it's almost like their defense of it is blind. I mean, the, the cryptos have counterparty risk just by the fact that they're they're dependent on computer systems, and the internet is counterparty risk. 
and supposedly they, they, you know, the blockchain technology is impervious to hacking. Well, I find that hard to believe, considering the NSA developed the the underlying the underlying technology for it. So, I mean, it tells you right there the NSA has a backdoor into any of these blockchains. And I just, I still, you know, until proven otherwise, I don't think there's anything, any computer system that's not impervious to being hacked. So you got counterparty risk there. Um, and I, I just, and, you know, Bitcoins are basically de facto fiat currencies because you can create an unlimited number. Um, there's, uh, there was an article that, it was actually on CNBC, and initial coin offerings are now, they're raising more money with these ICOs than early stage VC funding is raising right now, which to me is just staggering. And that says it all. To me, that says, that says all you need to know. Well, here's another source of counterparty risk. Peter Schiff pointed it out. You have to trust that the person in charge of mining these Bitcoins is going to keep it limited to the amount that they say it they will. So... Um, at any rate, I, I really think that these cryptos are in a bubble, and I think ultimately you have to ask yourself, well, why is why is the U.S. government, why is the, the, the Federal Reserve, why are all central banks tolerating these things? And because, to me, it's it's already, they, they know that it's a source of control for them. Um, you know, when they, when they start rolling out their own digital currencies. Um, but so I think a lot of the money that's going into Bitcoin and Ethereum and whatever is, is just hot speculative money and it'll flow right back out as soon as, as soon as this mania starts to pass. Um, but I do think there's people who are buying Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever the coin du jour is um, thinking that it's, it's a, a, a safe haven and, and if these cryptocurrencies weren't available – I think a lot of that money would be going into gold and silver right now. Um, yeah, but I did look at a chart earlier, and I know earlier this week gold way outperformed Bitcoin, at least in the middle of the week. So, and I, I guess Bitcoin might have been up today. I didn't really look at it today, but um, so you know, ultimately, gold and silver are the king safe haven source. Be, you know, because we saw. You know, we saw a geopolitical event that spooked the market and gold and silver shot up. Bitcoin didn't do a lot in the middle of the week. And most of Bitcoin's rise has just been on a speculative fury. I mean, if you ask the same question, Elijah, last year, when uh, the entire cryptocurrency universe had less than $30 billion market capitalization, even though it had risen quite a bit, uh, it really wasn't having a big impact on flows that, would, or siphoning off flows that were going into precious metals. But now, it's, you know, it's over $100 billion market capitalization in terms of how much money has flowed in and supported these crypto markets. So it, it does have an impact. But in the grand scheme of things, gold and silver combined are still so much larger in terms of how much money as a store of value exists. Bitcoin and other uh, cryptos are a heck of a lot more volatile, though. They're uh, receiving a lot of speculative flows, and the Chinese and the Japanese this year have been pretty aggressive in terms of how they've used it, uh, Chinese in particular, for capital flight. So, you know, the bottom line with the cryptocurrency universe is that it's ultimately going to be able to be influenced and controlled by governments, whether that be because of the on-ramps and off-ramps to commerce and how, as these currencies presumably become more mainstream and are adopted by more merchants and people can use them more in commerce, governments can very easily make the point of leverage the merchant themselves, never mind the people who have a wallet with uh, the cryptos in their wallet and so forth, and the tax reporting that might have to come with that and the onerous regulations for an individual. When you're a merchant and you're trying to deal with making commerce in a currency that's flipping around 50% volatility swings in a calendar year and uh, having to report on uh, the taxes of that to the IRS and then have onerous regulations that the IRS has and other, you know, Securities and Exchange Commission or what have you have yet to dream up that, could, that they can slap on the market. There's a huge amount of counterparty risk as well as regulatory risk and government threats. The libertarians, uh, you know, I'm principally a libertarian. I'm, I'm pretty much 
in that camp, but I think most libertarians have not uh, given enough credence to how vicious governments can get when it comes to something that actually will uh, potentially serve as competition to their fiat domain and paradigm. And above and beyond all of that, it's clear that you know, government of Canada and the United States and, and China and Russia and possibly working together as well, too, and other major governments are kicking around cryptocurrency platforms trying to develop uh, alternative parallel systems that they might want to use at a later date, not just for the blockchain recording elegance of transaction value, but outright new fiat currencies that they would you know, launch and be able to corral people into a cashless economy in some um, you know, future crisis response. So uh, the, the markets are not uh, as much of a safe haven as people ascribe them to be, for sure. And the bubble is, is very clear. I mean, countless people have been asking me all year, how do I get into Bitcoin? How do I do this? And they never even knew what Bit they couldn't even spell Bitcoin last year. <laughs> they didn't even know it existed. <laughs> this is a bubble right now. All right. Well, David Kranzler and Eric Dubin, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had? And I guess we can start with Dave. I think we kind of covered a lot of the things that were sort of at the top of my agenda today. So, um, you know, we're in the summer doldrums here. I, I think we're probably, I think this North Korea thing will blow over. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see a snapback rally in the stock market next week and, and a fade in the precious metals market. And I think you, any dips in the precious metals, you can buy them. And I think you'll be well paid off between September and December. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think really the only major risk that I see on the horizon that could upend what I look towards as my forecast for the second half of this year would be some kind of surprise uh, singing of kumbaya in the United States Congress where you know, both Republicans and Democrats come together to support uh, some kind of a Trump economic agenda that would include uh, major infrastructure spending along with um, – maybe repatriation of uh, profits that corporations hold abroad and some kind of tax forgiveness that's linked up with another larger context tax uh, reform plan. Um, because, you know, both both sides of the aisle would appreciate something like that that would help the economy and, and they can possibly put on hold the, you know, the, the fricas that's going on between all of the, the partisan factions and the hatred of Trump. And, and that could conceivably give us a six month pop in the stock market. But beyond that, I think the stock market and standard equities market as rep represented by S&P 500 and small caps, et cetera, uh, is running on fumes. And I think we're going to see the a lot more pressure in the stock market as the months proceed and that that will be uh, a tailwind, very powerful tailwind for precious metals. One more thought there, because Eric reminded me, talking about the government, um, one thing that's been lost in the shuffle all summer long, financial TV's not, not reporting on it and they probably won't until it like, really is in your face, but there's a, a debt ceiling limit that is going yeah. to cause a lot of problems in September. And I thought about that because I don't think there will be a kumbaya between Congress and Trump. <laughs> and I think it's going to be a really nasty debt ceiling fight. And probably if it was, you know, some kind of reconciliation, it would come after September. You know, the calendar, the, the chronology doesn't match up. So I agree with Dave. 